Where's the beef? Welcome everybody, I'm John Lavie, President of Toastmasters On Purpose. I want to welcome all of you to this, the very first Toastmasters On Purpose Table Topics Workshop, following on the success that we had with our Evaluation Contest Preparation Workshop in the fall. You may uh, or may not know that we put on a workshop for table for the Evaluation Contest participants, and of the Eight division finalists who participated in the district finals, five of those finalists either participated in our workshop directly or watched it on video in preparation. So we think we have a pretty good track record in helping people prepare for Toastmasters competitions. We're going to extend that now to prepping for the table topics contest. Our uh, videographer uh, is, holy moly, Tim Bolger. Bolger. Wow. <laughs> they say you're not supposed to make apologies when you're up front, but Tim's a friend, and I really ought to remember his name. <laughs> Let me just come up a bit with this. So, Tim has a quick disclaimer, and then we'll get on the show. Just to let everybody know, tonight's presentation will be videotaped for posterity to go up onto YouTube. If you do not want to be taped and you do participate, please see me and I will edit you out. Now tonight I'd like to turn it back over to John so he can turn it over to our Toastmaster. All right, thank you very much, Tim. <laughs> our Toastmaster this evening is Distinguished Toastmaster and Toastmasters on Purpose Charter Member Jerry Evans. Jerry? John Labby said. We're excited that all of you could be here this evening because on the coattails of our successful evaluation workshop, and as John mentioned, a lot of the folks that participated in that went on at various levels. A number of them made it to district. In fact, Virginia Bossman, who I'll introduce you to all our members, she wound up coming in second place in the evaluation contest. So we're really thrilled that all of you could be here with us tonight and for us to present table topics. So I'm going to run you through what, how we're going to do this tonight. But first, what we'd like to do is quickly, if we can just go around the room, if you can tell everyone who you are and what club you're from, we'll do that very quickly. And then I'll introduce everyone to the members of Top Toastmasters. So Sue, if we can start with you. Sue Hathawanter, Fox Valley Toastmasters. Sangeeta Bhargu, Hapu College Toastmasters. Hello, I'm Brian Vanderjack. I'm with the Hoffman Saints AT&T Toastmasters. I'm also with Kickstarters and Lombard. Thank you. Alka Oberoi with the Harper College Toastmaster 715 Group. <laughs> <laughs> Beth Reed, I'm with JSC Palatine Toastmasters. P. Russell, JSC Toastmasters, Palatine. <clears throat> Rick Westcott, Harper College Toastmasters Club, right here. <laughs> Steve Scott, Chris Alike, Toastmasters, Club 2724. Hello, I'm Dorota Perez, and I'm with Schaumburg's Toastmasters. Hi, I'm Roger Matthews with Mount Prospect Toastmasters. Good evening, I'm Betsy Joy Carroll with the JSC Toastmasters in Palatine. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. So now let me introduce all of you to the members of Top Toastmasters. So we'll start with our treasurer, and she's sitting at the back table. She'll also be our facilitator tonight, Virginia Bosserman. And we'll move up to the table here. And this gentleman right here on the end is, tell them who you are. <laughs> uh, my name is Nick Bontuano. As Jerry said, I belong to Toastmasters on purpose, and I also belong to Harper College, which, as Rick said, meets right here. Bob? <laughs> My name is Bob Roman, and I'm a charter member of the Top Toastmasters. Val? Valerie Fusam, and I'm a member of Top, Windy City, and also Long Road Lake Zurich. John? My name is John Pickle. I'm a member of Top, 
CEC uh, Corporate Club and then Arlington Heights. And I will let John tell you what clubs he belongs to. John is our president. No, I belong to Top and also Toastmasters on purpose. So now that we know, uh, wait a minute. That, is top. that was the same club twice. <laughs> I'm not doing you, well tonight. Are you a dual member? In it's a really good thing that I'm not trying to try my hand at table topics tonight. <laughs> my second club is Toastmasters Plus, which is Alka's home club as well. Okay, Rick. What is charming? What is the charter member? Yeah. I'm glad you asked that question because most of us who are members of TOP, Toastmasters on Purpose, let me take you quickly back and tell you how TOP started. At the time, which was back in 2010, this is spring of 2010, uh, Srinivas Sainini and Kyle Rohde at the time, he was the district governor. Srinivas was the lieutenant governor of education and training and we had been talking about starting an advanced club because at the time there were four, kind of teetering on four, but there wasn't an advanced club in the northwest suburbs. So Kyle and Trini got together along with some other uh, district, district leaders, and they had their first meeting actually up in Palatine at the library, which at that time I didn't attend that initial meeting. And then about a month and a half, two months later, we started Toastmasters on Purpose in June of 2010. And as we met, we were trying to figure out, you know, what we were going to call the club. So we were all talking about elevating, taking evaluations to a different level, and taking our speaking to a different level. And so as we're sitting there kind of brainstorming. I said, well, what if we just call the club top? And they go, okay, that sounds pretty good. I said, but they know how I love ac acronyms. So I said, let's call it Toastmasters on Purpose, top. And then Mark Robinson, he's one of the founding members also, and that's how we came up with the name, Top Toastmasters. And right now, there are only four advanced clubs in the Chicagoland area, or in District 30. And you could cons consider a couple of those clubs, and Valerie, she belongs to Windy City Toastmasters, but that's really more of a specialty club because the model that they have for an advanced club is much different than the other advanced clubs. Because they don't do table topics, they don't do invocation, they don't do 30 second go around, joke master, etc. They strictly concentrate on speaking and it's primarily for those who are aspiring professional speakers or who are already professional speakers. Which brings us to top. So my fellow Toastmasters, first of all I want to wish all of you a happy new year 2014. This is the beginning of 2014 even though we're already halfway through the Toastmaster year. It's incredible how it started July the 1st, and here we are in January the 15th. So welcome, all of you, to Top Toastmasters. As I said, it's the only advanced club in the Northwest Division, and John was the Northwest Division governor last year, and still, other than there's one other club that's in the Northeast Division, which is um, speaking of success, but that's the only other club, north-wise, that's an advanced club. And then we'll get into how tops a little bit different. So tonight, winning table topics. Virginia is going to come up a little bit later, and she's going to facilitate. She's going to walk you through some strategies and some ideas, how to improve your chances, your odds of winning not only your club, your area division, and hopefully going on to district. And she's going to give you some strategies and how you can better do that. I love this quote because it kind of sums up what Table Topics is all about. Mark Twain said, it usually takes me about three weeks to prepare and develop a good impromptu talk. A good impromptu talk. Of course, this evening, we don't have three weeks. And being a Table Topics contestant, you don't have three weeks to prepare for it, do you? How long do we have for Table Topics? What's the timing? One minute. Pardon me? One minute. 30 seconds. Three minutes, 30 seconds. Three minutes, 30 seconds? Try again. Two minutes, 30 seconds. <laughs> to prepare in a few seconds. We have two minutes and 30 seconds to answer whatever the question happens, wow. happens to be. So if you want to break it down in seconds, 150. it's 150 seconds that you have to answer the question to come up with an organized thought 
and we'll walk you through that. So that's the end of my PowerPoint slide presentation. So what's going to happen is that shortly Virginia is going to come up and, I'm sorry, John is going to come up first, I'm moving ahead of myself, and he's going to walk you through the judging criteria. It's very important for us to understand this form and what the judges are looking for as far as evaluating the tabletop contestants. When he did that for the evaluation, the feedback that we received from those that were participating, they were saying how helpful that was to them in terms of really doing that for evaluations and then moving on for the various levels of the contest. And I presume that that will pretty much be the case this evening because sometimes we don't take the time to focus on those criteria and John's going to walk us through that. So at this point, then let me welcome up our president, Mr. John Labby, and then he'll walk us all through the judging criteria. John. Thank you very much, Gary. I'm going to hand out copies of, if we just pass these back, of the judge's ballot form for the table topics contest. Mostly I wanted you to have that so that you have a reference while we go through my presentation. Now, if you are intent on beating a friend in a contest, the very first thing you need to know, it seems to me, is what are the rules? How do I score points? If I'm going to play ping pong, I need to know how to score points. If I'm going to play my friend in poker, I need to know how to end up with more chips than she does, right? That's what we're about in these next several minutes, is to look at how to score points while competing in a table topics contest. So, basically, what usually happens in a contest is that the contest judges use the form that you see in front of you. Well, they do use that form. What usually happens is that they will follow the judging guidelines that take up the top 80% of that sheet of paper. Sometimes judges have their own system for choosing which performance is best from a given group of contestants, but most of the time, and certainly all of the time that we train contest judges here in District 30, we recommend that they use these point values in order, to, in order to give themselves a thorough and consistent assessment of each table topics participant's performance. So what does this setup look like? Well, first off, there are three groups of criteria. Content, delivery, and language. And as you can see, content, the stuff you talk about, is actually worth more than half of the point values. How you go about presenting that content is broken up into 30% on delivery. And we will get into specifics about each of these criteria in a moment. But then 15% is attributed to your use of language. So content, 55% overall, and it breaks down into two areas, as you can, and you can see this on the balance. So 30% of this is development, 25% effectiveness. What does this tell us already about the nature <coughs> of the table topics competition? Anybody? What is this starting to look like? A mini speech. A mini speech. A mini speech. So development, what does that mean to the judges in the table topics contest? It means that the speaker puts ideas together in such a way that it makes sense to the audience. How many of us 
have witnessed a table topics presentation, whether at the club level or in a contest, where the speaker starts here, wanders around over here, and ends up a minute and a half to two minutes later in an entirely different state. They start talking about ice cream and finish talking about World War II. We've seen this. We've all seen this. But if you're going to compete, the judges are looking for you to present a coherent message, a cogent, coherent message that can be understood, that has a purpose, that includes an opening, a body, a conclusion, and if you make a claim, such as, for example, let's say you're hit with a topic along the lines or a prompt along the lines of, what was your favorite movie when you were young? And you say, well, my favorite movie, and, and why, right? So that's the big kicker, and, and why? So if, if my favorite movie when I was young was The Graduate, and I'm proud to say that I wasn't really all that young when it came out. <laughs> but I was in high school. I was still in high school. I would say, well, I really liked The Graduate because there were scenes at that time, at that time, at 16 years old, there were scenes in that movie that I couldn't possibly have seen anywhere else. There was a scene in a strip club. And man, I liked that when I was 16. <laughs> there was a scene with some great long distance driving, and that was kind of cool. So I have, you have to support yourself with reasons. They might be foolish reasons, such as the ones I just gave, but they're real. You have to support your claim in order for the judges to truly see your speech as excellent. Now, some 20-25% of the points available to you come by way of how effective that content that you put together. How effective is it? What are they looking for? Well, they're looking for whether or not you made the purpose clear. And how are you going to do that? You're going to do that with a very clear statement of some sort right up front. I remember last year, at I believe it was our division table topics contest. The prompt was something along the lines of, if you had the opportunity to make any law, what would it be? And as it happens, for one particular contestant, the Toastmaster forgot to shake his hand. Now, we all know that if you're a, a, a member of a Toastmasters club and you're about to give a speech and the Toastmaster forgets to shake your hand, your vocal cords don't work. You're not allowed. Those vocal cords, they just, the habit is there. They don't work until you shake the hand. So finally the Toastmaster gets it, she goes out, she shakes, shakes the man's hand, and immediately says, if I could make a law, it would be that we would shake hands. Could there have been a clearer statement of purpose? And then he went through some argumentation, but it was a spectacularly successful table topics presentation, in part from the situation, but especially because he drew from the situation and made a stunningly simple, clear presentation of purpose. And then the rest of the speech has to support that purpose. Just like if, if you were a lawyer arguing a case, my client is innocent and here are the reasons why, everything else you say after that darn well better show why your client is innocent. Same thing in your table topics presentations. All right, so delivery is 30%. Almost more than half of the balance of the points come from your delivery. Physical, body language. Are we using, is the speaker using body language that reinforces the points or contradicts them? That's what the judges are looking for. 
So I realize that you're having to make decisions about your speaking in very, very rapid little bits of time. And I know that Virginia is going to be presenting some ideas to how to do that. I'm just telling you what you need to be prepared to do. And you need to be prepared for every element of your speech to be a coherent whole that works together. And that includes your body language, your gestures, and so on. And it includes the use of the physical space in the speaking area. So if you are using your present, your, your response to the prompt to do something in chronological order, for example, you might move from stage right to stage left to support that chronological order. You might use different parts of the stage to tell different parts of a very brief short story. Oh, and by the way, speaking of short stories, I want to interject something just from my own. You can tell a very, very short story within the time it takes to do table topics. Here's a short story. Seen in classifieds. Baby shoes for sale. Never used. You can tell a short story in very few words. All right, what else? You have to present with your voice. You should be using your voice expressively, just like in any other kind of a speech. This is the criteria, these are the criteria that your judges are going to be looking for. Flexibility, emphasis, emotion, can you be heard, are the words easily understood? Language, is it appropriate? Is it uh, fitting to the occasion? All right, proper degrees of grammar and so on. That's five points. That's the smallest criterion on the page. Now, you see what we have here? The International Speech Contest Ballot. See any similarities between the ballot up here and the one in front of you? As Valerie said, it's a mini speech. That's what the judges are looking for. So, know the criteria, give a speech. After all, that's what you're being judged on. You have 150 seconds. Use it wisely. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, John. I would ask that you write down any questions that you have because we'll have time this evening to, after we go through the actual presentations and go through the table topics, so that we can come back to that because as thoughts occur to you, please write them down at the time, save those, and then, you know, all of our panelists, we can all share with one another and kind of brainstorm, if you will, Toastmaster Storm, because when we did the evaluation contest, a lot of questions came up during the workshop. And so we were able to answer those, which helped the contestants when they actually participated in the contest. So now we're going to move on to our next part. Before we move on, though, I didn't ask you that in the beginning. If you have any device that makes noise, if you just please put it on mute or silent so we don't interrupt our contestants or our speakers when we get to the table topics. This portion now is going to be done by Virginia Bossman, Distinguished Toastmaster. And she's going to walk us through some strategies, some techniques, and some ideas how to better improve, as I said earlier, your chances of making it through the different rounds in the Table Topics Contest. So please help me welcome Distinguished Toastmaster, Virginia Bosserman. Well, I don't even know if I really need to uh, go on and after that presentation that John gave. I think you guys are all set. You know exactly what the... Judges are going to be taught, looking for, right? You were taking notes, you know exactly what to do. I'm not going to go over that because that was already done so well by my colleague. <coughs> what I'm going to talk about are some, some techniques you might want to consider ahead of time that you could practice to get ready for table topics. 
I know some people think, table topics? You can't get ready for table topics. You can't practice. You don't have to write a speech. You don't have to, but there are things that you can do to get ready for table topics. Why is this? Okay. You can prepare for table topics. One of the things that you can do is you can brainstorm a list of topics. For instance, we just had holidays. Frequently that comes up, especially in club table topics. If you could, if you could invent a holiday, what would it be? How would it be celebrated? You could think of something like that. You could think of your favorite holidays, what you like about the holidays, what you wish would happen around the holidays. You can think about vacations. You just go down the list. Favorite presents. If you could go back in time. If you could do, if you won the lottery, what would you do? Just make a list of all different kinds of topics across the board. And then in the next column, make a list of some responses that you might come up with and practice them. Now those aren't necessarily going to be the topics that are going to come up at your contest, but you've sort of planted the seed in your brain of how you might handle these if they came up. They might not be exactly the same, but they might be along the same line. Okay? So you can start off by something like that. Think of politicians, I mean, all kinds of things. All right? Then you want, you can practice a technique, and that's what I'm going to go through next. There are some techniques, basically, they're basic speech techniques. All right, how do you put together a speech? Well, you put together a mini speech very similarly, <coughs> only it has to be a lot quicker. And then, what do we always have to do? We have to rehearse. We have to rehearse just to get familiar answering a question. You want to have in your mind the typical, thank you, Mr. Table Topics Master, fellow Toastmasters, dignitaries, and guests. Now, why do we do that? We do that because it's a Toastmasters tradition, but we also do it to warm up our mouths and give us a few more seconds to think of what we're going to say next. A lot of people like to repeat the question. Again, a few more seconds to think about the answer and to clarify in your head that you heard the question correctly. Because sometimes the beginning of the question doesn't match the end. Any of your clubs that have those table topics cards, they're the strangest things in the world because they start off talking about Darwin, and the next thing you know, they're asking you something else. And if you didn't follow all the way through, you might be preparing an answer for the wrong thing. So you want to listen very, very carefully, and often repeating the question helps solidify that in your mind. If you already have a great answer, as soon as they say it, don't bother with that, jump into your answer, okay? Because you don't have all that much time. Have anybody here heard of Johnny Campbell? Okay, the transition man. He's spoken a lot at Toastmaster events. He's a distinguished Toastmaster. He's a professional speaker and trainer. And he's, he was the president of Chicagoland NSA. He's recently moved out of state. But he has a program, and you might want to go to his website and order it, or some other great ones, where he goes through some techniques for impromptu speaking, which is what Table Topics is, and it's what we do every single day. People come up to us and ask us questions that we're not prepared for all the time. It happens in job interviews, it happens in meetings, it happens on the phone if you're in customer service or sales. So, the first thing that Johnny says that you should do is you should open by gaining the audience's agreement. Now that doesn't mean that everyone is going to agree with what you're going to say, but that you all agree on the same premise. And I'll give an example of that in a minute. But these are five steps, so I want you to get the five steps first and then you can take notes for them. So open by gaining the audience's agreement. And then present the problem or the question. So that's why a lot of people repeat the question. And you would often do this, again, in a work setting. You might want to clarify what the person actually asked you. Then you want to state your overall 
response that you have. Not the details, but you're just going to sort of give an introduction as to what you're going to talk about. Is this starting to sound familiar, like a speech? You're going to welcome them, you're going to tell them what you're going to talk about. Then guess what? You're going to process your solution. You're going to actually make your points. Now, in table topics, you may only have one point. Unless you're really good, you may have a couple that you would want to list. And that's where you would do that. And you would talk about the benefits of those or why you think those are good. And then your final thing will be your call to action. There should always be something, some reason that you've done this whole thing. What do you want people to do with it or do because of it? It's also think of it as your summary. What I like to tell people is to make sure you're watching the timing lights or the cards so that you don't have to end abruptly. Because that's something that a lot of times makes people forget what the person said in the table topics because they missed one point or they weren't quite clear. So you want to make sure you've got 15 or 20 seconds to give a conclusion. All right? And that's usually where your call to action is. Now I want to go over the opening by gaining the audience's acceptance. Okay? Because there are some phrases that you could write down, and then I'm sure once you hear them, you'll think of some of your own. So, if you're like me, all right, that would be an answer, like maybe you said the question was where you want to go on vacation. Well, if you're like me, you really like to travel. And then you would go on from there. What I would like to share with you today so you're letting them know that you want to, and you want to gain their, actually in this case, you want to get their attention, okay? Imagine, just that one word, imagine, it's a sunny day, you're at the seashore, people are already picturing what you're going to say before you've ever said it. Another one, very similar, picture this. What was that, that show, the lady would always say, picture this, it's 1942 and I'm in Italy. Golden Girls, that was it. If there's one thing we can all agree on, it's that Toastmasters helps people improve their communication. You don't get any argument from anybody here, right? Okay, so now what I want to talk about is some stumbling blocks that you could perhaps get over by thinking about these things. So you've got your basic outline, right? You, you know how you're going to construct your answer using Johnny's technique or something very similar to it, however you do your speech. So if the table topic is something that you're totally unfamiliar with, for instance, if you ask me what, uh, what I would do if my car broke down, other than calling AAA. I don't know anything about cars. Well, I would bridge from something I, I don't know to something I know. So let's say I was a nurse or a doctor. Then I would have a premise to base my answer on. So I would say, even though I'm not familiar with cars, what I would have to do is I would imagine I would diagnose the problem. Do I have gas? You know, did, you know, did the car start? Did it make a noise? What did it do? And you would go down the line. So you want to go from something you don't know anything about to something you are familiar with and you can speak about. Right? You don't have to answer the question exactly the way it's posed. So maybe you just don't like the setting of the question or the premise that it was based on but you know something about the topic. Well, then you would just reframe it and put it in a, in a setting that works for you. So let's say it's something about, they ask you about you know, who, who was the best basketball player, uh, Michael Jordan or Scottie Pippen? Okay, well, maybe I don't know anything about basketball. I could switch it to baseball. 
and I could say, I don't know very much about basketball, but when you talk about sports, I think everybody in Chicagoland remembers Ernie Banks. And you could go on about what's great about sports and baseball. The monodrama is another technique that you can use to help work your way through the subject. You're letting the audience in your head. Well, I suppose if my car broke down, the first thing I would do would be look for my cell phone so that I could call AAA. And if I didn't have my cell phone, then I think the other thing that I would do is I would put my flashers on and stand outside my car and lift my hood up so that some nice gentleman would stop and help me. Okay. Moderator is another technique. <coughs> Pretend you're Jay Leno or Oprah Winfrey. And you don't want to insult the person with your answer, and you only know a little bit about the subject. Well, you, what you do is you talk to both sides of the subject and stay in the middle. So you don't take a strong stand, you sort of do point counterpoint. And that will, it will sound intelligent, it will get you through the topic, and hopefully you'll win the contest. You can take your answer to extremes. Now this is kind of fun because it would become really more of a tall tale or something that would be so exaggerated that everyone in the audience would find extremely funny. And so sometimes I think that wins contests when people are laughing a lot. And I know we had a, a question a couple of years ago where it was, you know, if you drove your car into the house or something, how you would, you would tell your significant other. You could really go overboard with something like that, all right? And again, you can do that with any topic. Devil's advocate is the other thing. And this is a favorite of politicians and lots of people. So it doesn't have to be something you really believe in. Go the other way. Have a lot more fun with it. You know, they say, well, what do you think about raising taxes? You could say, you know what? I think they should absolutely raise taxes. I think our taxes should be 75%. And then I think every single thing should be free. I would never have to pay for the doctor. I would never have to pay for the dentist. I wouldn't have to pay anything else because I, everything else would be free from the government and the rest of the money would be just play money. Whatever you want to do, just give an answer that's intelligent and that makes a point and has a conclusion. So, how do you prepare for table topics? You think about it in advance, right? You do a little prep work, come up with some subjects that you know about, that you maybe want to look up and learn about, maybe get a couple of you know, old presidents' names, what time in history are you, do you like, if you ever had to go back in time, something like that. Then you're going to practice the technique, either Johnny's or another one, where you're going to have a structure in mind. And so the, that list of topics that you came up with, try it out with that. How would you answer that? How would you quickly have a beginning, make a point, and summarize it? Okay? And then finally, you're going to rehearse. It's like anything else. Any speech that we give, we have to rehearse. So you want to, the week before, just periodically be thinking about table topics, be practicing answers, be practicing <coughs> your opening, so that when you walk up there in the contest, it all just rolls off your tongue very easily. Because you've put it in your mind, and it will just come out quite easily. And that is how I think you can practice for table topics. And I wish you all good luck. Thank you, Virginia. Good stuff? Yeah. Let me ask the question again. Good stuff? <laughs> Is everybody awake? Yes. <laughs> Just just checking your pulse to make sure. Yeah. A little bit different than probably what you've been exposed to before on tabletop, correct? <coughs> I think uh, I had an opportunity, uh, John and Campbell and I worked together doing some seminars and workshops, and when he first introduced me to this idea, this technique, and then Virginia and I were talking about it, 
So it's just one way to answer table topics. And it's interesting because as John was talking, and he was mentioning this gentleman, uh, some of you may or may not know him. His name is Tom Pedrick. And Tom, who was competing in the contest, that's exactly as John mentioned, that's how he answered the question. And it was just, just like he was a setup by the Toastmaster because she forgot to shake his hand, and so Tom used that. And then we had the extreme of that, you know, where Virginia was talking about something really exaggerated. Liz Kistner, who's a member of Harper Toastmasters, <laughs> Barry Mixon and I and Virginia were sitting in the back of the room, and then I know Liz really well, and also Nick is a member with her and Harper Toastmasters. And as John mentioned, the question was about a national holiday. And so she went to the far extreme and she started talking about squirrels and nuts. And we couldn't figure out where it was all going to tie in. But I mean, it was hilarious. It was really funny. She didn't answer the question directly. But again, she really took it off topic. So that's just another idea. And then John mentioned about uh, in 2000, actually in 12, when Barry Mixon, he actually won table topics. And as John mentioned, the question was, if you drove your car into the garage, you know, how would you explain it to your wife and kind of put a positive spin on it? And Barry actually told the story. Because if some of you who were there might remember, he said, hey, baby. And he pretended like he was having a conversation with his girlfriend at the time. And so he wound up winning the, uh, the contest. So as Virginia summarized, to practice some of these ideas and techniques, because I think we would all agree they definitely will help you in terms of preparing for table topics. So now we're going to take this information, strategies, and we're going to give a number of individuals, actually five individuals, an opportunity to, just like in contest mode, I'm going to ask the table topics question. The participants are going to come up and answer the question. And then our esteemed panelists are going to give them feedback. And the format's going to be, each one of them is going to give them three minutes of an evaluation. So John and Valerie will do one thing, and then Bob and Nick will do the next person. We'll do the next person. Make sense? All right, so John and Valerie first, Bob and Nick will do the second person. And these questions are going to be at random. They're not all going to be the same question for everyone. We're going to mix them up a little bit to add some spice and variety to it. And so I would like to call up our first contestant, our participant this evening, and that would be Sue Hauswalter. So if Sue were a contestant, everybody, I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to explain the rules. You're getting ahead of me, Madam Treasurer. So if we were in contest mode, so the sergeant arms would have the contestant in the back of the room. They would hold them there until they motion for the contestant to come forward. Because sometimes they've done it in reverse where they've asked the person to come up. That's not really protocol for the contest. The sergeant arms holds the contestant in the back of the room. There's a minute in between. And then the Toastmaster reads the question. And then the contestant comes up. So the question for you, Sue. So I would say contestant number one, Sue Hauswalter. Which is more important, intelligence or common sense? Which is more important, intelligence or common sense? Sue Haswalter. Which is more important, intelligence or common sense? I think the real question here is, which is more rare? intelligence or common sense have you ever known the person who can quote baseball statistics eternally knows the entire history of the country of england but can't remember to bring their car key with them when they leave the house and can't remember what they need to do every morning. Even though they get up and do the same thing every morning, they don't remember it. The person who looks at a problem and overanalyzes it when there's such a simple solution that if they would just use the common sense that they have, 
they'd be done in a minute. I really think common sense is rare. We all have so many things that we know and that we can use in our experience, but to simply look at situations and say, this is what I'm going to do, this makes sense, I think is a very rare gift. Mr. Table. After the contestant, those of us who are familiar with table topics, she would then sit down and then the judges would have one minute to mark their balance. And of course the contest toast must were asked for a minute of silence while the judges do so. But tonight, a little bit different. We're going to turn to our panelists. Before we start getting the feedback though, I'm going to have them briefly explain. John, if you could do that, explain exactly what they're evaluating on. They're going to do some of it based on the judging criteria, but there's specific things that they're going to be giving feedback on as far as the evaluation for the contestants. So, John, if you would. Sure. My name is John Pakel. I'm going to be evaluating your answer on delivery and language by going through that, and then I'll turn it over to Valerie, and she'll be handling the content of how you answer the question. A couple things that I noticed as far as your physical, I sense I saw a rocking back and forth and I'm not sure if you were trying to contemplate where you wanted to go with that as, as a mode of thinking. And it, I'm not sure where you could have gone with that. Just uh, part of that. The voice, you use pauses, and I think a lot of that is you're formulating where you wanted to go with that. Um, the way that you answered the question is you restated the question to where you could answer it and that helped you get started with your thought process and I thought that was very effective because it did answer the question what's more important by stating what's rare it's just a different word but it puts you in a different place but I thought that was very good Valerie Fusan Sue, I think you did a really great job because you had what's more important intelligence or common sense. And first you repeated the question, and then you went on to what well, the real question is. So you were able to rephrase it, reframe it for your benefit to make it clearer for you, but I think it also made it clearer for the audience as to what you were going to cover. So I thought that was a really good strategy to do that instead of jumping right into what your opinion was. And then, so that was a very good opening, and then you went into your opening, your, um, your body, which was what your, what your opinion is. You used examples, good examples, and then you made a point about it. And you used several examples and a point, referring to the baseball and then uh, what common sense is in your opinion. Your ending, you had a nice ending also, with a very rare gift uh, of common sense, that very few people have that. And I think you, you could have made that a maybe a little bit stronger, a little stronger ending with asking the audience, do you have more common sense or intelligence, or what is your opinion of uh, common sense or intelligence, but referring it back to maybe the audience and then summarizing it. I thought it was very effective. You achieved the purpose with cabin points and examples, and I think the audience was very uh, responded to you and was listening to you. And overall, I think it was effective because it was clear. Thank you. Thank you. So now you can see how the process is going to work and then we'll kind of recap when we, when we go through all this and, and towards the end, again I would suggest perhaps maybe you want to make some notes because then we can come back and, and John as he makes his closing comments toward the end, perhaps some Q&A, some things that you can refer to the various participants and just in your mind what they did really well and perhaps things that you thought they could improve on. So now let's go to our second contestant. So, Mr. Pete Russell, come on down. How are you, Jerry? Cont 
contestant number two. Pete Russell, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you are? How old would you be if you didn't know how old you are? Pete Russell. How old would I be if I didn't know how old I was? Boy, that's just so wide open. I love this question. How old would you be if you didn't know how old you were? There's no reference point. Boy, I could put on my driver's license, I'm 21 again. I'm excited, I want to get a couple birthday drinks. On the other hand, I could sign up for AARP. I'd get discounts at the movies. This is a wonderful world we live in. I can't believe it. How old would I be if I didn't know how old I was? What a tricky question. But once again, your age is really only a state of mind. In today's world, there are people, one of our former presidents, who just this year didn't go skydiving on his birthday with a bunch of Marines at the age of 91. There are other people that are 19 or 20, have no sense of adventure, and don't do anything. How old are they really in their mind? Maybe they're 60, maybe they're 70. They don't have that drive. So age is a state of mind. I don't look at anybody because they have gray hair or they don't. I don't look at anybody because they have wrinkles or they don't. What I look at and I think about when I see somebody is what's in their mind, what's in their heart. And that's what tells me how old they are. And it also gives me the reference to how old I am. <laughs> Mr. Coastal. Thank you, Pete. Now we shall turn to our esteemed panelists. So Bob and Nick will evaluate Pete on his tabletops. Bob? Bob Roman. Pete, uh, let me first start with starting out is that uh, I didn't think you had enough time, you, you had too much time trying to think of, a, of an answer for this, and you repeated that question too many times for me. And even when you try to do a transition, you use the question again for making a transition, which this should have been an easier topic to come up with if you didn't know what your age would be, is age is just a number, it's what you feel. And then you got into it after a while, after standing up there. But the part that I thought for effectiveness, with the repeating the question, just was a little bit too much. So you can state the question, but then start coming up and developing your answer. And uh, I have some other things for one. And one thing that I point out is judges are going to be looking for how well you answer the question. I am not a fan of completely sidestepping a question because we do this, we practice in Toastmasters for the audience but also for our work. And in a place, so if your boss asks you a question and you sidestep, sidestep the question, is that good? I don't think so. He wants he wants an answer to the question. So if we start practicing sidestepping questions, we're not going to learn what Table Topics truly tells us and, and <coughs> that we learn from. That it, it teaches us to answer any question the right way. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Okay, I'll be covering that, the physical uh, side of the, the Table Topic. The first thing, and I struggle with this, is when you get a hard question, try not to turn red. I know it's <laughs> But I, I really like your, your voice energy. I think I've seen you speak before, so you, you, your vocal variety and, and just the energy that you present with is good. I liked that you seemed excited. You actually, at the beginning of the speech, you kind of jumped around a little bit to show that excitement that you had about the question. I also agree with Bob, you, you 
as you were thinking and as you repeated the question, I, you could have walked around more and used a little bit more of the stage because I could probably draw a circle around. You probably stayed in that spot the whole time. But there's no reason you can't walk and, and think. And then you used a lot of words that you could have used your body to match it. For example, you said the word mind. You could have went like this. Um, if you said skydiving, you could have done one of these. You used the word gray hair. Whether you have them or not, you can point to it. You used the word wrinkle. You could, whether or not, again, you could, as you say the words, you can kind of point and people will kind of connect with that. And then um, I probably saw this because I was sitting here, but you had a closed fist and it was a very open, kind of fun loving question. And a closed fist kind of shows a lot of tension. So it, as anxiety. much as you can, anxiety, which is probably probably thinking, but as much as you can, open gestures. This I think this shows sharing more openness. You, and you were kind of like this as your face was red. So, <laughs> but I've been there. So. But other than that, great great energy. Keep it up. Thank you. <laughs> You said you were going to give me a question on barbecuing. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who remember, when Pete participated in the humorous speech contest, I thought he was going to go, tss, yes. when he was putting that perfect dimple in that hamburger patty. For those of you who didn't, it's, it's posted. Tim has all the video on the humorous speech contest, so you can do that. So now we're going to move on to participant number three. And I have a special question for this person. Betsy Carroll, come on down. <laughs> Betsy. Contestant number three, Betsy Carroll. Is it more fun to be a parent or a child? Is it more fun to be a parent or a child? That's secure. Well, is it more fun to be a parent or a child? My answer is both together enjoying life every moment. I have been a teacher since I was a little person. All the little kids in my neighborhood would come over and I taught them math and art and baton twirling and all sorts of things. And as I grew, I became a professional teacher. And then I started to work with uh, seniors and it's kind of like a teaching mode. And what I guess I'm saying is, it doesn't matter if you're little or if you're big, life is about sharing it together, being together, um, eating together, playing games together. I don't care if I'm with a two-year-old that's crawling up on my lap, getting slobber all over me, or if I'm with an 80-year-old that I'm wiping their slobber. It really doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is the dignity of all people, and I hope you agree. You don't get to go anywhere yet. <laughs> this is where the feedback part comes in. Okay, great. Here we go. <laughs> All right, we'll start with we'll start with verse at this time. We'll start with Valerie, and then we'll we'll go to John. Val, I can't write this fast. <laughs> Betsy, that was an interesting question, and I think you handled it really well. But you started out with, well, is it? I think you could have started a little bit stronger with, with rephrasing it and then going into your story. Uh, you want your, your beginning to always be strong, and you want your ending to be strong, just like in a speech. One thing that you did miss is that you did, I didn't see that you acknowledged anyone, the Toastmaster or the audience. So you want to keep in practice with doing that because you might get some dings when you're doing it for real in a, present, in, in a contest. So you always want to make sure that when you're doing a contest, you always acknowledge your Toastmaster or your contest chair and the audience. 
your you rephrased your question, and you also had a nice story. A nice story when you were a child, and you took us through a timeline from child to professional. The other thing I really liked about your table topics is that you had a message in it, your message, and you conveyed that to the audience, and I thought that was nice and clear and touching. But life is about sharing it. I thought that was a really nice message that enhanced your table topics. And then you ended it with, I hope you agree. I think you could have made that a little bit stronger also. Uh, possibly saying that, do you share, you know, how do you share your life? Or may, again, maybe referring that to the audience and taking it back and making it real for the audience. And, and then having your summary. So in conclusion, life is about sharing it. And I'd love to share it with you or I'd love to share it with my family. The effectiveness of your, your presentation I thought was, was very good. It was um, direct. You were enthusiastic about your topic. I think you could have been a little more enthusiastic, a little more, a little more passion, because with the message that you had was a passionate message. So I think you could have brought that out more in your, your passion. Uh, your energy, and uh, but I think you answered the question very clearly, and was effective. So in conclusion, I think just if you were to have a little stronger beginning, a little stronger ending in your in your speech, and have a little more passion and energy with your topic, and have fun with it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Betsy. A couple things that I noticed that I really liked. First off, the idea of a timeline. You were talking about how you were a teacher when you were little to when you became a teacher and now you're helping with the elderly. You can see your personal timeline. And then you also referenced teaching a toddler as they're climbing up and using your body language. <coughs> And uh, the word that you used that I really liked was slobber. Because I can picture the toddlers doing that. And then you brought it to the elderly and helping them. Because you hear a lot of, I've got an older uncle, older parents, that I know I'm going to help as they get older. And there's going to be things that were both uncomfortable. And I'm learning that it's important that they get to keep their dignity. And so you brought that up, and then when you said, you know, uh, wiping the slobber off the elderly, and I just like to tie in that it doesn't matter if they're little or big, we all slobber, and it's just about the dignity. So I really connected with that. Uh, the voice was very monotone, and I noticed there could have been a little variety, and I think uh, Valerie said the right word is bringing the passion into it, because your words clearly said that, but the voice inflection didn't follow up with that. Um, and that, uh, the appropriateness, the youth to the old, and just tying the whole age, and the value of every person, regardless of their age, was a very powerful point. Thank you. Okay, so those are three participants. John had a great suggestion, which I would agree with, is that I think what we'll do now is we'll take a brief 10-minute break so we can fellowship and you can have some of the, uh, the goodies in the back and get hydrated with some water or some coffee back there and, and take a restroom break. And then we'll come back and then we'll have the other two participants. And then actually John has a surprise that we're going to incorporate into the mix and we'll have some time again to uh, to get some feedback so 10 minutes name an effective political leader in history who couldn't speak well Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall there aren't any because when it comes to a disease freedom like requires this, leadership no and leadership requires oratory you have to speak to be heard I have a dream 
It's all about personal growth and guts. Never give in. Never, never, never. Okay, welcome back to the remaining portion. So at this point, let me give you a little unabashed commercial for Toastmasters on Purpose. On the table over there is a flyer all about Toastmasters on Purpose. And we are actively seeking, encouraging new members to join TOP. So let me give you a quick commercial for TOP. You do have to have completed your CC to join Toastmasters on Purpose. That is a requirement. However, having said that, it does not prevent you from coming to TOP, getting a, giving a speech, and being evaluated by our esteemed Toastmasters. We have the highest concentration of distinguished Toastmasters of any advanced club in the entire District 30. Because when we initially chartered the club, 80% of the club was all district leadership, and we've continued that tradition with the exception of two of our members, I'm sorry, three of our members, everyone is a distinguished Toastmaster. Every single one of us, as you heard earlier, we all belong to multiple clubs, so we do walk the talk. And some people have a misconception about top. It, we've had people come who've given their icebreaker speech, people have practiced for contest, that have practiced their presentations, extended presentations, because that's one great thing about top is that you can give an extended presentation and test it out and then get feedback from all of the members of the club. And a lot of times we have a lot of guests come to the club and we ask them to also participate because other than the formal evaluations, which are pretty intensive and involved. We also ask our audience members to give, you know, we have a round robin where we turn it over to everyone so they can also give the speaker feedback. So strong evaluations, as I said, specialty speeches, the diversity of our membership. We all come from various clubs, so we've all been involved in Toastmasters for a good length of time. And we're very purposeful because uh, John, especially this year, the seminars and workshops that we put on, we've been very, very purposeful. And so we've really refined our direction as a club. We keep refining our evaluation process. And so we keep growing and learning as experienced and seasoned Toastmasters by becoming more involved. And the one thing we all subscribe to, uh, because Bob is a past district governor, and we have division governor, Valerie's division governor right now, and John's been division governor, I've been an area governor, Virginia's been an area governor, Tim's been involved in district leadership. And so, our standards, we hold our standards really high because we think that Toastmasters, it's all about excellence, not just about getting up here and giving a speech. It's really getting up and giving a speech that you really care about and that you have a real message to share. <laughs> That's really the spirit of Toastmasters because we can all get that check in the manual, but will we remember that speech a week, two weeks, three weeks later? So there's a flyer on the table. Please take a look at that, take it with you. And the membership application, you can see myself, Amy Samatos, who's our Vice President of PR. She isn't able to be with us this evening. She's actually in California doing some training, but we welcome any questions you have of any one of our officers and Toastmaster on Purpose members before you leave this evening. So let's get right on to the remaining two participants this evening. So let me call up Gina Coates. Gina, come on up. <laughs> on the flyer, I did not mention we meet the first and third Wednesdays, 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock in this room that you're in. Harper Toastmasters also meets in this room. Contestant number four, Gina Coates. Have you ever seen insanity where you later saw creativity? Have you ever seen insanity where you later saw creativity? Gina Coates. Children. <laughs> All the time, creative. All the time, we can't understand them. All the time, Insanity, but maybe it really is creativity. My daughter Maria, nine years old, displays this trait, the insanity with creativity connection. My husband calls her the crow. She likes to pick up anything shiny and just put it in her pocket or put it in her backpack. Lots of times it's candy and things she probably shouldn't have, but she does it. One day, my daughter Lisa 
started to have an asthma attack. My daughter Maria knew how to get to her medication and get it to her sister because she has a good mind. She knows where things are. When she took all of these stolen things, in the middle of all these stolen things was a Band-Aid. It came in very handy when we were at the park and my daughter Lisa fell and hurt herself. Maria scrounged through her stuff. She knew where it was. We didn't understand her logic, her system. But Maria did, and she saved the day with that Band-Aid. Mr. Tabletop, it's Mr. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> we can't leave yet. We have to get some, some feedback from our panelists here. So I think we're starting with you and Bob this time, so we'll start with Nick. Nick? Do you now be covering the delivery aspect of your table topic? I, I like a lot. I like your energy. You came in, I mean, from running up here to uh, receiving the question, you received it uh, with a lot of positivity. I like that you didn't stay in one space. You, you kind of walked around. I think you were kind of formulating your thoughts as you were thinking about your reply. You made a good, you used the word connection, and you went like this, which I thought was good. And then you had this one point where there was a realization, and, and you made this gesture, uh, which I thought was good. So I thought, I thought as far as hands, you were using them um, there was, there was a lot of animation, but they were also matching up to what you were saying. I think there could have been a, a little bit more fun. And then I think the other thing that we could, we could all do is, with some of the opening strategies, we could, we could incorporate body language. For example, imagine, or picture this, we're all children, or you have a child, or something like that. So I think even with some of the, the, the strategies that Valerie talked about, I think we can kind of practice to use our body to present those. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Starts with a V. Yeah. We always check this out. Some other points. Um, you, you mentioned pocket, putting in the pocket. Um, there was an opportunity there. Okay. Asthma. Uh, that could have been fun. Uh, not that asthma is funny, but the movement in asthma that could have brought some humor, but other than that, I really like your energy. Good job. Thank you. Okay. Gina. Mr. Roman. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Okay. Yeah. I would have, again, did an introduction. And why is an introduction important? Because it's telling the audience you're ready to speak. And everybody can tune in instead of checking their email or whatever. But when you come up here and right away say children, I'm sure that some of the people could have missed that. Mm -hmm. Even judges in the audience. Even though some people laughed, it, it might have been too abrupt. Right. Okay. That is to start out. And then again, to use one of the suggestions, if you were like me, it has to be children. <laughs> and then again, that would get a response, a laugh and then go in, because how you answered it, but it was just that I thought in the beginning part of it, because you went right into it and said the one word, it's possible people could have missed that. But again, stated, insanity, creativity, you know, if you're like me, it has to be children. And then go into it. And then I would have liked to see you then just tie it up a little bit more towards the end as I repeat the question and almost come up there. There's no other answer. Children. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, Gina. Okay, and our final participant this evening, Mr. Brian Vanderdeck. Hey, Brian. Contestant number five, Brian Vanderjack. What smell reminds you of childhood? What smell reminds you of childhood? Brian Vanderjack. <laughs> Mr. Contest 
chair our fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, which I think makes most of us, right? If you're a guest here tonight, raise your hand. On the way here, you probably weren't thinking about the smells on the way in. You're thinking, got to get here, got to go, whatever. But when you're on a long-distance trip, let me tell you, smells can mean a lot to you because you're so bored you have nothing else to do. The smell that brings back my childhood, the fantasy of a vacation in the car with my parents heading out to Michigan from the city of Chicago was the effervescent smell. The beautiful reminder of where we were about to go. Gary, Indiana, <laughs> steel mills. Awesome. That meant we were at least halfway to where we wanted to go. Another smell from my childhood again was smell from my dad's rose garden. Because I found out at a very young age what was special about his rose garden. What was special about his rose garden was the sound he would make when you cut that rose off, pull it to your nose, smell it, and just happen to leave it behind on the driveway after he spent all summer growing that rose. <laughs> <laughs> the smell of summer. Another smell from my childhood was the beautiful smell you would get. And raise your hand if you've ever smelled this. is right after it starts to rain. That clean smell that rises to your nose and just brings your whole self back to the moment of knowing that you are alive. Alive to do things like smell. Mr. Cactus Chair. Thank you, Brian. Okay, we'll start with our panelists, and I believe, John, that you're up this time. Yes. Brian? couple things that I noticed very much on you, very dramatic, and I, 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 I've never heard you speak before, so I don't know if that's normal or natural for you. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not the right way to say that. Um, or if it was just you incorporating a lot of what we've been talking about all night into the answer. Your voice inflection, we've talked about being monotone, and you went down to a whisper, to a scream within a few moments, and a lot of points in between. There was a lot of emotion, a lot of passion. The idea, I mean, you said Gary, Indiana, and I think we all had that same nauseous smell in our nose <laughs> as we've all gone through there. Uh, I really liked the way you used the floor, you walked around, so I really enjoyed your presentation as far as physically and where you were and how you were. Brian, I was like, I've seen a lot of your speeches and your, your presentations and I, you're always passionate about your topic so I really enjoy that. Uh, you engaged your audience well. You're, you developed the speech very nicely. You asked the audience a question first, so you got their attention. And then you went into some stories. And you developed little stories about different, different smells, Gary, Indiana, the flowers, and you demonstrated them while you were also developing the story, which, again, gave, your, it gave the audience a, a big picture of what, what it meant to you. And uh, you, you had a nice conclusion also. Some of the suggestions that I would make is that um, because it's only a, a one to two minutes, one to two minutes, I wouldn't ask the audience to raise their hands. I would just, if you want to ask them a question, it's fine. But keep on track with your topic. Because sometimes when you ask for a question, you might start to pause there. Um, you do want to pause in certain areas of your speech to make it clear. You know, I think you, you're very dramatic, and then sometimes they, I think it rolls into, they, your thoughts roll into each other. So I think if you pause a little bit more and concentrate on the thought, the idea, rather than trying to make everything, you know, dramatic. So have your thought, 
present it with passion, like you do, but pause between ideas, pause between stories, so the audience can have a chance of catching up with you, because you have a lot of information. So one suggestion would be to pause more and make, I would say tone down your passion, but have it, make it more effective. You, you, I'm going to go into the delivery part, is that you moved around a lot. I would tell a story in one spot. It's, it was more like you were dancing around. So tell a story in one spot, move to another spot. Make each story, each movement a purpose, purposeful and effective. And I think that will improve your, your presentation, your table topics, your speeches. But again, pause and be more effective with your idea and your movement. Thank you very much. Okay. I would love to thank all of our five participants. Let's give them a big round of applause. I would also like to acknowledge and thank our panelists, Nick Bellantuano, Bob Roman, Valerie Fusan, and John Peschel for being our panelists this night and helping the participants. And now I will relinquish control of the lectern over there, and let me turn it over to our president, John Labby, and he has, as I said, a sprinkle of surprise for you, so we're not quite finished yet, so you all might have an opportunity to participate in something. John. <laughs> all right, so I hope you've all enjoyed our, our our, our evening so far, and if you're like me, <laughs> yes. where did I hear that before? If you're like me, you heard some of these prompts and said, oh man, I've got the best way to answer that, I hope, or I've got a really good way, or man, I would really mess that one up. Anyway, if you're like me and you're just sitting here, you probably began to think, gee, I'd like to take my, I'd like to take a try at this. I'd like to take a whack at this. Here's what we'd like to do with some of the time that we have remaining in our session. Earlier tonight, Virginia presented several strategies for succeeding with a table topics presentation. Do you remember those strategies? Things like telling a monodrama, using the devil's advocate approach, right? You remember those strategies? What I would like to ask for are two volunteers to respond to a different prompt, and I'm going to ask each volunteer to try their hand at a specific technique. So, a specific way of framing your answer to the prompt. Do I have a couple of volunteers? What's Somebody, the prompt? What's that? What's the prompt? We want to know in advance this time. Not in your life. <laughs> Not in your life. But we will do things a little bit differently, and I'll, I'll ask you, if you want, to start from near the back of the room. Give yourselves 10 or 15 seconds to prep. But I will tell you your strategy so that you can get your mind thinking in that vein. Who's up for this? Somebody who didn't sign yeah, up and wishes they Sure, had. sure. Ideally, somebody who wasn't a participant earlier, but who would like to take a crack at it now. Beth? Rick? Beth going to try? All right. Okay. okay. So Beth? I want you to get you. I want you to get into your best over-the-top exaggeration mode. Okay. Think big. Here is your prompt. What is your favorite wild dream for your future? What is your favorite wild dream for the future? 
Beth Reed. Fellow Toastmasters, think with me here. Imagine if each of us was the winner of this latest lottery. Now, what we're going to do is we are going to think about all the places that have helped us in our past. And anonymously, we are going to give a bit of this money to each of these places. In my case, it would be a little library in Jackson, Ohio, and probably a few other libraries here and there. It would be a school district, again in Jackson, Ohio, because that's where my kids were. It would be probably some things from my childhood. I'd have to put some thought into it. But it would have to be some of them close enough that I would start to hear, did you hear? Someone gave this money to this institution. And they were able to institute something that they didn't think they'd be able to do. And I'd go, really? That's really cool. Who do you think did it? And they'd say, oh, so-and-so over there, they just, they got a bonus. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. And I could just enjoy the knowledge that this money was out there doing something fun, but hopefully then not be inundated by people who thought that I should give them money for their fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope that all of us come away from this time together with some new ideas about how to approach table topics. Further, I hope that your experience in watching or participating tonight has given you not only some ideas for improving your approach to table topics, whether in your clubs or in competition, but that you can extend or that you will extend the same ideas into your regular speaking. Because after all, what we've been training in this evening is super condensed speaking. This is the Campbell's soup of public speaking. Super condensed. Add water, add milk, and then you get a seven minute speech. <laughs> There's got to be a table topics response in there somewhere. <laughs> I'm reminded of two table topics responses that I have seen in the past. One was the, the monodrama that Barry Mixon told with which he won the district table topics contest a couple of years ago, Jerry alluded, alluded to it. Bizarre situation, right? You've just driven your car through the front living room window. How do you tell your spouse or significant How is this a good thing? And he, yes, and it's a good thing, and he talked about that. The other that I'm reminded of goes back a couple of years before that when the district table topics contest prompt was very strangely worded and nobody and i mean nobody in the room really understood what the question meant and the eventual winner blew it off he essentially said, you know what, I didn't really understand the question, so here's the question I'm going to answer. <laughs> now, I agree with Bob that the essential purpose of table topics is to train us to think on our feet for other than Toastmasters purposes. But if you're intent on doing well in a table topics contest, everything you saw tonight is about setting yourself up to give 
a good, though highly condensed, cogent, coherent speech. Maybe with a few laughs. And I hope you've all enjoyed the laughs that we've had together tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Who here, by the way, has their CC? How many of our guests have already earned their CC? And among you who have already earned your C, your, your Compton Communicator and are not <coughs> members of Toastmasters in purpose, on purpose, do you have any tools by which to escape tonight without one of us talking you into joining? Because <laughs> I would like to see what your arguments are going to be. I joke, sort of. <laughs> we really do welcome new members. This is part of why we put on the workshop. We love giving to others in the district, but face it, folks, this has been a two hour and a half, uh, two and a half hour commercial. We hope you enjoyed it. Now you will we'll return to your regularly scheduled programming. Virginia. What's, what's happening on February 5th? Oh, on February 5th, thank you very much. One week before somebody's birthday. But anyway, the essence of February 5th is that we will be right back here in this room doing a very similar workshop to help people prepare for that other contest that is going to be happening in the spring, the International Speech Contest. So if you have a hankering to do well in the International Speech Contest, Get yourselves back here. We'll have an Eventbrite page up and publicized within 24 hours so that we, we didn't want to steal the thunder from tonight. But as of tomorrow, it will be possible to register for our International Speech Contest Workshop, which will be right here, same time, same bat station, February 5, 2014. Any last notes before I stumble to an adjournment? Yeah. Rick. Question? Yes, yeah, yes. I ask yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I have two. Do I have um, to answer it in one and a few minutes? <laughs> sure. The first one, you know, at the club level, and I've attended club level table topics and contests before, you don't seem to have judges that really know what they're doing. When it comes <laughs> yes, to that, that's, that's, the that people that are picked sometimes that happens. aren't really, they don't stick to the topic and they go off, but they get picked because maybe they like or liked by the club and that type of stuff. In the area contest, are all the judges trained? Yes, yes. Trained? yes. you must they, they have gone through the how many district training in order to serve as a judge at the area or higher. Okay, area level how many higher. judges are minimum for an area contest? Area contest, five. There has to be five? Minimum. That's the minimum. Minimum. You have to be trained every year to yes. be judged. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. So everyone who judges in the table topics and international speech contests that will be occurring in the spring at the area contest level and up, they will all have been through the district's contest judging training session. Yes, Pete. Table topics, when the Toastmaster moderator or co-chair or whatever gives you the question, they read it a second time. Right. When does the clock start? The clock starts the minute you make an action or say something that is can be perceived to begin your response. So for example, so if you wanted to take 60 seconds, you can't. Okay. You you really can't. Yes, you you could do that, but I can but let me assure you that the judges will whack you <laughs> badly. Your knees will never be the same <laughs> if you take that long. The expectation is that you will you'll hear the question usually while standing some distance from the speaking area and the expectation is that you will when your when your name is spoken and you have heard the the prompt for the second time that you'll begin walking to the speaking area and within a few seconds right. begin your response and and honestly if you take much much longer than that I think most judges would whack you in some way. Yeah, I would agree with John Pete. I would say if you take, because you can kind of center yourself and kind of get ready to give your response, if you take more than five seconds, you're going to get dinged. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Rick again. So, my third question. <laughs> Relating back to what 
Pete just said, starting out. Right. In the evaluations today, the first two, nobody said anything about greetings. Mm -hmm. And they didn't do greetings. Mm -hmm. The third one, it was brought up. Mm -hmm. The fourth one, it wasn't really uh, mentioned either. But on the fifth one, Brian gave to me what was a proper greeting. And always Mr. Contest Chair or Madam Contest Chair. Right, right, right. And then fellow Toastmasters and guests. Right. When you do that, is that in your time? Yes. Yep. Yeah. The so minute you time. begin to speak, it's or if you take a, if you make an action that that the judges perceive or the timers perceive to be the beginning of your response. So, for example, let's say the prompt had something to do with sports, and before you say anything, you make a motion like you're playing baseball or shooting a basketball or something like that. That motion begins your time. The clock starts. Clock starts the minute you do anything that is that appears to be intended to communicate to the audience. Okay. Okay. That's it. So then, related to that, do you acknowledge everyone like Brian did, or do you repeat the question, or do you come up with something clever, or how should you start? Most people recommend, as I know Virginia said, and as a couple of people from our coaching panel pointed out, using the traditional protocol of acknowledging the Toastmaster or contest chair as well as fellow Toastmasters and guests gives you about seven or eight seconds to do some thinking. Some people argue that it is a very good idea to repeat the question. That also gives you a few seconds. Some people might think that that's a little excessive buying for time. That's your choice. But the initial recognition is a part of Toastmasters protocol. Now, it does not have to happen at the very beginning. It doesn't have to be the first few things you say. I think, for example, to the response that Gina gave. Mm -hmm. When she began, quite emphatically, children. Right? right? Mm -hmm. and, and she could have talked for maybe another few seconds to, to make her point, right? <coughs> that children almost instinctively present what might look like insanity, but is in fact high levels of creativity. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests, I give you for evidence my daughter Maria. And then on she goes. So she would have given herself almost 20 seconds probably to really frame the response. So yes, that's, that's, uh, that's certainly our recommendation here. Any others before we? Gina. Yes, Gina. I was going to comment that even if you don't necessarily need that time to think, it's going to be more well formed than if you hadn't done it. So. Yes, I and and I think value it was, in that as well. Right, and and as I think Valerie, I think it was who pointed out that if you omit that protocol. There are judges who will probably ding you a couple of points, and sometimes all it takes is a couple of points mm -hmm. to distinguish between first place and fourth. And I can tell you from personal experience, you do not want to finish fourth. Okay. And That's on that note, to on that bombshell, we are forgetting something, though. Are we? Yes. Demonstration for you for a table topic, if we could. Jerry, do you I'm have sorry? a question? We'd like to see you do a demonstration. You want to see me do table topics? We'd like to see you do one if it's no problem. Jerry, do you have a question for him? Sure. Hoi! Okay, fine, fine. <laughs> but can I walk to the other end of the yes. building? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Tim, since you, why don't you give the question, because you asked me a question in between, so why don't you pose the question I know that you're dying to ask John. All right. Why is it that any time you wear a white shirt, there's coffee stains on it? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Topics Master, fellow Toastmasters and guests, coffee built America. You did not know that. You probably think that tea was the origin, the foundational drink 
of America. But I tell you, that is not true. It was coffee. Coffee, which became known in the Western world during the late 17th century, fueled two things. It fueled the Industrial Revolution, and it fueled political revolutions, and here's how. Coffee is a stimulant. Beer is pretty much its opposite. Up to the point when coffee appeared in the Western world, and by the Western world I really mean Europe and the Americas, beer was the most common social drink during the day. People would go to the pub for their lunch during the business day and drink beer. Beer had a depressive effect on the thinking and ambitions of those who partook. But when coffee took over <laughs> and people became more stimulated, thinking improved, thinking became sharper, memory improved, and at about the very same time we started getting the Industrial Revolution and the political revolutions of the American Revolution and the French Revolution. I am a revolutionary and I wear my coffee proudly. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> right and, and as they say on Top Gear, on that bombshell, thank you and good night. <laughs>